folks, we're back. This is Steve Sanson and Stephanie Phillips with Veterans in Politics. Today's guest is Amy Wilson. She, she is a candidate for Las Vegas Justice of the Peace Department 7. But before we get to Ms. Wilson, Stephanie, do you have any rants? I do. Well, last time I ranted about gas prices. So this time I think I'm going to rant about the gun legislation that's going through Congress. Oh. So they want to ban ARs, of course. They want to ban... I love my AR. They want they to ban, ban that. Well, don't tell the public that you have one because they're going to come get it. Um, Try. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to ban high capacity magazines. Oh, I they love want, those. They want to, but you never I don't know when you have multi <laughs> multi people you have to put down. Right. <laughs> I don't think it's going to make it through the Senate. But anyway, they want you to force you to lock up your weapons in your home 24 seven. Well, good. Is tell that? you what to do. I know it doesn't do any good. Um they want to change the age from 18 to 21 to buy it. Unless you're military. No, they uh, If you can go to the military and have a weapon and die for your country. You know, the average combat I've, age in Vietnam is 19 years old. That's my argument. The average if combat you're old age enough in the war to go in die, is 19 years yeah, old. <laughs> if you're old enough to go die for the country mm -hmm. and, and fight, you're old enough to own a weapon. Just because there's a tiny part of the population that are criminals and they're always going to be it doesn't matter they can legislate as much as they want they can make laws they're never ever gonna fix criminals and murderers that are going to kill regardless of when they start banning hammers then we have a problem we got a problem <laughs> but anyway there's more to that but it's all going through congress right now and we'll see when it hits the senate floor but i think it's going to die in the senate thank goodness because that's against our constitutional rights people so, yeah. you know, they said don't infringe upon, but I have a little thing yeah. about crazy people getting guns, you know. <laughs> I understand that. I, I, I know, but no laws. I mean, they're, you can't diagnose a crazy person when you're at the gun store. Oh, you, that's why it's called background a, check. I'm for the background check. That's right. Check. But a background check can only go so far. True. So you can't tell where someone's a psychotic going to go kill somebody with a background check. That's so, true. Well, anyway, there's that's, my rant. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have one. I just want to, you know, I, I just want to remind people that early voting has started and um, it ends on Friday. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the primary night is on Tuesday. And there's going to be a lot of chairs on Wednesday and there's going to be a lot of tears on Wednesday. And, uh, you know, good luck. So I got to say, I'm glad I'm not. But we may not know, though, because of the way they changed the until voting laws. Until two weeks laws. later. Yeah, wait until the end of June. Amy uh, Wilson was so. up before she turned off her TV at midnight. And all yeah. of a sudden, she wakes up the next morning like, what happened? Yeah. Better not do that to Amy Wilson. <laughs> all those magic ballots <laughs> are going to. Don't put that out there, well, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, I put them on notice so they know not to do that. Let's not do that. Okay. Right. Miss Wilson, tell us yes. about yourself. Well, my name is Amy Wilson. I am running for Las Vegas Justice Court Department 7. Uh, the department right now, uh, the sitting judge is Judge uh, Karen Bennett Heron. She's served for, I believe, about 24 years and she is retiring, so it's an open seat. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been an attorney for 24 years. I've practiced in California, Arizona, as well as here in Nevada, and I have practiced in every area of law, the Justice Court handles cases. <clears throat> I started out as a criminal prosecutor in California with the Orange County District Attorney's Office. What part of Cali? Uh, Orange County. What part of Well, County? I was originally waiting for bar results. So I was at the big courthouse in Santa Ana okay. as a, uh, a clerk in the Ritz and Appeals Department. Once I got bar results and I passed, I was sworn in as a deputy district attorney. Okay. I was assigned to the Westminster Courthouse, okay. uh, where I worked as a prosecutor, did uh, wow. gosh, a lot of uh, misdemeanor cases. And then um, we moved up to the Bay Area. So I was with San Mateo County okay. uh, District Attorney's Office up there. We lived in San Mateo and then Belmont. Uh, my former husband went to dental school in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So we lived there for a few years. And I, again, prosecuted misdemeanors, also did gosh, countless felony preliminary hearings. And uh, then I, I spent some time as a criminal uh, defense attorney. Uh, it, was, it allowed me to be home more with my young son at the time. And it was a good experience. I represented clients that were indigent and uh, they didn't have a public defender office in San Mateo. It was a panel of attorneys. Mm -hmm. So we were court appointed, but we could also take private cases. And that was a good experience. I think it's important, especially in the position I'm seeking, to be able to have 
uh, insights and experience on both sides of the aisle in the criminal cases. So I've been a prosecutor. I've also done criminal defense. Uh, I'm currently a civil litigator. I've been with my current firm for about seven years, and we do we practice primarily in personal Are you a injury. Partner in the firm? I'm an associate. Okay. Um, we've had conversations about that. I'm I'm pretty comfortable as an associate, okay. and uh, but I, I I work with Kevin Hansen and his daughter uh, Amanda recently became licensed. So there's three attorneys in our office, and uh, we practice primarily in personal injury. I, I skipped out on Arizona because we did live in Arizona for about uh, eight years, and I I was licensed there and practiced. That's with a lot the, of skipping those eight years. I know like, <laughs> a lot of moving around. I just I, you know just love taking bar exams. It's so much fun. <laughs> Let me tell you. Have you taken the New York bar? <laughs> uh, no, not the New York. Uh, no, I've taken California, Arizona, and Nevada. And uh, California, Nevada, they said was one of the um, highest. California and Nevada absolutely are two of the most difficult bar exams in the country. And New York is the other one. I've heard that about New York. I have not taken New York. I have no plans of leaving Nevada and taking any more bar exams. Uh, but Nevada was tough. It was. And California, when I took it in 1998, February, uh, the pass rate was 39%. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've heard the California bar has gotten a little bit easier over the years. I don't know. I haven't practiced there for a long time, but... Uh, so I was in Arizona for eight years. I was with the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, but in the criminal division. Uh, I worked in the probation violation department. Okay. I also handled one of uh, the, worked for the office out in one of the satellite courts the, mm -hmm. out in Surprise where I lived. And then I sat as a judge pro tem in Maricopa County for the last three and a half years that we lived there. And it's interesting, Arizona, it's similar to uh, Nevada in that we have uh, the justice courts, the lower state court, mm -hmm. and then we have district court here, they call it superior court in Arizona, and then up to the appellate courts. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in Arizona, you don't have to be an attorney to run for justice of the peace, which I thought was shocking actually, uh, especially in Maricopa County, which is huge, it's bigger than Clark County. Mm -hmm. And I understand in Nevada, in the smaller, more rural communities, if there's you know, right. a population less than- 100,000, I think. I think it's 100,000, like then you, know, you don't have to be an attorney to run for, for, for uh, justice of peace. be a common peace. sense judge. <laughs> well, there's no reason for that to be the case in Maricopa County, Arizona. There's plenty of attorneys. But interestingly enough, to sit as a judge pro tem in Arizona, mm -hmm. you do have to be an attorney with significant experience. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting. And, and to their credit, most of the judges uh, that were, were not attorneys, mm -hmm. when a trial would actually go to a jury trial, they would call on the pro tems mm -hmm. to come sit and preside over the trials, mm -hmm. which I thought was probably a, a, good, a good decision to do that. So I had a lot of uh, judicial experience in Arizona and the justice courts there handle the same kinds of cases as the justice courts here. Everything from the evictions, traffic, small claims, Criminal cases all start there, except the Maricopa County Attorney's Office at the time I was there uh, did most of their felonies through a grand jury indictment. They didn't put on so many prelims, and I'm, I'm not sure why. That was just what they were doing at the time. Uh, and then, of course, the civil cases as well. So I had that experience. We moved here in 2012. I uh, got licensed, and since I've been in Nevada, I've been practicing in the civil, uh, civil side of the law. The first year I worked for a firm that practiced exclusively in landlord tenant law. So I have that experience as well. In fact, that was my first experience appearing in court here was in the justice court in the eviction court. Mm -hmm. And at that time it was Judge Saragossa, who's now the chief judge of the justice court. She had that assignment. Then I believe Judge Cruz had it for a little while, uh, mm -hmm. the evictions calendar. Then I, I switched firms and I didn't appear in justice court too much anymore after that. But I've been sitting as a judge pro tem in justice court for the last, well, I got appointed in 2020, December of 2020. So that's a, that was a long answer to your question. But that's a little, little bit about my legal background. Uh, I'm also uh, a mother. I have three sons. Oh, wow. My, uh, my oldest son and his wife just made me a Mimi almost a month ago. My first grandson was born Congrats. on May 12th. Thank you. It's the He's just the best thing ever. And I was fortunate to be there when he was born. Mm -hmm. It was a Thursday. I got to work and I got a text. Hey, mom, I think it's today. We're going to the hospital. I'm like, okay, I'll run to the, uh, to the airport. So I ran to the airport, got on a flight, flew to Phoenix. Oh. And I got there into the hospital. Just, I think he was born maybe two, two and a half hours after I got there. And they... They allowed me to stay in, in the, you know, the birthing suite with them. So I was there when he was Aww. born with, with um, my daughter-in-law's mother and the two of them. It was just, 
there are no words. There are no words. And, and the, the love is just instant. And I, I can just hold him and just stare at him all day long. He's just the most precious thing ever. So we had that in May. We have this campaign going on and we had my little thing, like little thing the campaign and my full-time job and having a grandma. And then uh, my youngest son uh, just graduated from Palo Verde last week on okay. the 31st. So it's been wow. a month for us. All great things, just really busy. What do you kids do as far as occupation? Well, my oldest son that just beca mm -hmm. became a daddy is in school and works in Phoenix. He's okay. He's studying to do... It's tech stuff, but I think it's network engineering. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me what that is exactly, but mm -hmm. he does tech stuff and he works full time for um, discount tire in their IT department. Mm -hmm. And he's finishing his degree and uh, okay. what will go into tech technology. And then uh, my middle son graduated from Palo Verde in 2020 and mm -hmm. he works and teaches uh, swim lessons at Water Wing Swim School here, okay. which is kind of cute because we actually lived here <laughs> in Las Vegas in 20, 2002 to 2004, just quick before we moved to Arizona. And he, the, the school he's teaching at now, he went there and took classes when he was like 18 months old. So it's kind of 18 fun. months. Yeah, we, when we moved here, he was just not even a year old. And then he started doing swim lessons for about a year before we moved to Arizona. Oh, so you and moved now, there, you left and yes, came back. Yes, yes. Okay. So, uh, I say I've been in I've been in Las Vegas ten years this time, but we did li live here for a couple of years mm -hmm. back in the early two thousands. So he, now he works for that same swim school, but he's also taking classes at CSN. <clears throat> I, I'm not entirely sure what he wants to do. I'm not sure he's entirely sure what he wants to do mm -hmm. yet, but maybe something in business or uh, sciences. He's mm -hmm. exploring his options, and then. Uh, my youngest just graduated, and he, he's not entirely sure. He works for Dutch Bros, that little coffee stand mm -hmm. just over here. And yeah, I boycotted Starbucks. So. Oh, you did? Well, yeah. maybe check out Dutch Bros. I went to they're, Dutch Bros today. Oh, did you? Yeah, there's one right up the street. Oh, yeah, they're, they're all over town, mm -hmm. but they're a great little shop, and, and it's, been a, it's been a great job for him. And honestly, during when the school shut down during the pandemic, I mean, he was just in his sophomore year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, his whole junior year, they were home. And gratefully, he had that job because it kept him... Busy. You know, socializing, kept him busy, kept him, you know, not so isolated. So and it's it's a great little company to work for. So he's hoping to take a gap here this year and do uh, they, they have they call it the mob. I think it's called the Dutch mob where kids that have worked there for a while uh, go around the, the country. I know they call it the Dutch mob, I think. <laughs> I, I think that's what they call it. But. It's it's a great opportunity. When Oscar Goodman hears the word mob, he's like, Yeah, no, not that kind of mob. Mob of great, nice, <laughs> nice kids. Oh, back. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, they never left. <laughs> no. But they send these kids around the country to open up new stands and to train the new employees. So um, he's hoping to get on that okay. group <laughs> and uh, have that opportunity to travel around the country and uh, do that probably for a year or so. Then we'll see. We'll see what his. Where, where his path leads him. So could you explain to the folks that don't know, mm -hmm. what does a Las Vegas Justice of the Peace do? Absolutely, that's a great question. So the Las Vegas Justice Court, well, all the justice courts in Nevada are the lower level state courts. And quite frankly, if someone's going to have an interaction with a court, it's probably the justice court. Uh, everything from traffic tickets, evictions, uh, small claims court, uh, orders of protection that are not domestic, those are handled at the family mm -hmm. court. Uh, civil cases up to $15,000, and then all criminal cases start in the justice court. Felonies are bound over to district court for trial if, if or plea. If there's enough evidence. After, right, if, if, if there's enough evidence, they're bound over for, for trial in the district court. And a lot of them end up ple pleading out in, if, if they plead down to a misdemeanor, mm -hmm. they, can, they can enter their plea in justice court. If they're going to enter a plea, to a felony or gross misdemeanor, they have to either be bound over or waive their preliminary hearing to go enter that plea in um, district court. So, a, a what just, about ORs? Does that come through the, to the through the Las Vegas Justice of the Peace as well? It they they do because the first the first court appearance and o ORs is order <laughs> order to release, right? No, on, when an OR is someone who's released on their own recognizance. Own recognizance. Oh. So that comes up at the initial appearance. And that's also something that we do in justice mm -hmm. court. Might be interesting to know that our initial appearance court is, is running seven days a week. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, hearing masters and then also, you know, elected judges that sit on that calendar. And once someone's arrested, they're brought to their initial appearance. Mm -hmm. And at that time, 
a, a bail decision is made. Uh, there's a recent Supreme Court decision called Valdez Jimenez that uh, the, where our Supreme Court held that the state, so the prosecutor has the burden of proving that there's no less restrictive means to ensure the appearance of the defendant at the next hearing and to keep the community safe mm -hmm. than to set bail. Mm -hmm. So once the state has met that burden, then the court has to take into account a whole list of factors, statutory factors, in determining uh, what that bail amount is going to be. Mm -hmm. So the state, the prosecutor makes their argument, the defense makes their argument, and then the court makes a decision. That most often happens right there in that initial appearance. So if someone is being released OR, it's most likely that decision is being made in that initial appearance court where, where, like I said, it's seven days a week, there's a prosecutor there, there's a public defender there, and uh, sometimes private counsel will come in if they've been retained already for a defendant. But both sides are heard and that decision is made there. Now, sometimes for whatever reason, that a bail decision doesn't happen in initial appearance and it will come to the regular criminal calendar and uh, the defense uh, will ask for that hearing sometimes or the state will ask for it. Typically, in my experience sitting as a pro tem, uh, the defense will ask for a hearing. Either they'll say, well, there's new factors that we didn't know about in IA court or they didn't have their hearing in IA court, so we need to have it, have it in, on the regular calendar. So yes, very important bail decisions are made in justice court every single day. And I think that's really important because I think often the judicial elections can be overlooked. Uh, we're at the end of the ballot, um, especially when it fits a presidential year. This year we have a, a, you know, a gubernatorial race, we have a Senate race. Mm -hmm. And if, some, if, if voters don't make it to the end of the ballot or get to the end of the ballot or just doing an eeny, meeny, miny, mo, uh, that's, that's problematic because these are really important races. These are people that are making decisions every day in our community, in the courts, on our city council, the county commissioners, uh, our local, our, our state senators and assembly uh, people are making decisions that affect us locally. So uh, thank you for taking an interest in our, our, our race and, and, and helping to get oh, I, uh, the I message out. I take more out. than an interest in the judicial races. I've heard <laughs> that, Steve. <laughs> I've heard that. Most people don't know anything about the judges that are running. Right. I've had so many people call me, like I was telling you earlier, mm -hmm. and they have no idea who to vote for. They don't know any of these candidates. So. Right. So, and it's been actually very like heartwarming as I've gone through this process over the last few months to see how many people actually really do care and, are, mm -hmm. and, and, and do their research and come to events and get to know us. And then they share the information with their family and friends. So hopefully we have a more informed, uh, you know, our voters are more informed in these races. So when you bounce somebody over to district court, what, what are you looking for? Well, when someone is charged with a felony, mm -hmm. it starts in justice court and, mm -hmm. and the, the policy behind having a preliminary hearing or a grand jury indictment is that felony charges are really serious. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't want to, you know, saddle someone with a felony charge or, you know, potentially a felony conviction if there's not evidence to justify it. So the state has the burden of proving that there's, uh, you know, probable cause to bind them over to the district court and the charges. It, it, it's a check and balance on the system, really, on these serious charges to make sure that the state has some evidence that warrants holding the person over on those charges. So uh, when we, we, the preliminary hearing, it's the state's burden to put it on, so they'll bring in their witness. Usually it's just one, sometimes two witnesses to put on the, the evidence and in my experience, you know, you listen to the evidence, you have the witness right there to evaluate it, and you, know, you make a decision based on the facts that are presented and the law. Mm -hmm. And if the state doesn't meet that burden, then the, the charge doesn't go forward. If they do, then it goes, it's bound over. You've done jury trials before. I have. How many? You mean as a judge pro tem? Mm -hmm. uh, gosh, when I sat in Arizona as a judge pro tem, I remember doing a handful of DUI trials there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you look for in DUIs? Well, it, it's different when you're sitting as when you're presiding over the trial and there's a jury, mm -hmm. then you're making sure that, uh, you know, you're making evidentiary rulings. You're making sure that that everyone's following the rules. But ultimately, the, it's the jury making the decision. Right. 
uh, in a preliminary hearing, that's just before the court. So mm -hmm. I'm the one listening to the evidence and making the decision if the state's met its burden or not. Right. So, um, gosh, you look at a variety of factors. You, you, you listen to the witness testify. Do they seem credible? Does their story make sense? Uh, you look at the, the elements that are, the charges mm -hmm. and see if the evidence has matched and, and the state's met that burden. Mm -hmm. um, you, really, you, you, you observe and take in and consider all the factors that are presented. And you've done, in justice court, they're gonna do DV cases as well, right? Oh yes, yes. I've I've sat for a judge right now. There's two there's two courts in Justice Court that exclusively hear domestic violence cases. Mm -hmm. It's Judge De La Garza and Judge Dotson have mm -hmm. has that uh, calendar now. I've sat for Judge De La Garza a few times on on her DV calendar. So yes. What would you look for in a DV case? Uh, the same thing as as any case. Mm -hmm. do, do, does, has the state met their burden? Mm -hmm. Have they presented facts that mm -hmm. warrant a bind over or? Uh, you know, in my experience, that most of the time the, the state and the defense come to an agreement and uh, there's a lot of pleas that take place. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of times where a, a defendant's given the opportunity to do classes and uh, maybe do some community service and things and potentially have the case dismissed. Mm -hmm. You know, each situation is so different. And, right. and that's really important that... <clears throat> You know, the stack of files on the bench in the morning, it's not just a stack of files. Those are real people. That's mm -hmm. that's their life. And there's there, there's victims involved there, too. It's it, taking the time th that you can. Granted, it's a busy calendar, so we have to keep it moving efficiently. Yeah. But it's more important, in my opinion, to get the right result than to get a quick result. Mm -hmm. So if something needs to be taken under submission or continued out to take some time to really look at a situation, that's going to happen on my watch because I'm, I'm not going to just rush through things just to get done quickly. Why do you want to be a Las Vegas Justice of the Peace? That's a great uh, question. Uh, have you ever had that question before? I've had that question a lot, and mm -hmm. it's it's an important question, and it's something I've given a lot of thought to. Mm -hmm. I There's a lot of reasons, not just one, one answer. Uh, I've been an attorney for a really long time. I've been How fortunate. Long? 24 years I've been an attorney. And I've practiced in all these different areas and different states. Mm -hmm. And I, I've sat as a judge pro tem. I know I enjoy the job. Mm -hmm. And it's something, it feels like the natural progression of my career, uh, personally. It's a personal goal. But then also, it, it, I really see it as an opportunity to serve the community, mm -hmm. to be in a position where I can be impactful in, in meaningful ways. And not just by doing my job and doing it well, which I absolutely plan to do. Um, you know, suppose a judge could just roll in, call the calendar, roll out and be done for the day and be off. There's a few and, that do that. I, and I'm not <laughs> passing judgment on anyone. I'm just saying in, in any job, in any job we can, right? We can do it halfway or we can go the extra mile. Right. So what I would love to do and what, what is my style, just who I am is to really be prepared like I said, every file is a person, not a file. Mm -hmm. And to, to take an interest in, that I'm managing the courtroom efficiently, you have to be efficient, but you also you have to be fair and you have to be just and you have to get the right result and, and it, not a quick result. So take the time that's needed, to be, but to be efficient. And then when the calendar's done for the day to do the follow-up work I need to do, but there's a lot of organizations I'd really like to be involved in our, in our community. Mm -hmm. and. I mean, running for office, there are so many organizations I've learned about that I either didn't know that they existed or I didn't know much about them. Right. And now I am, I'm so excited. Whatever the outcome is of this, I, I am committed to being involved in, gosh, I want to do everything, but obviously that's not, um, <laughs> there's only so many hours in the day, but uh, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> for example, there's a program that uh, senior judge, uh, Judge Osterley, if you know her. Yes. So she does a program at the court uh, where she brings in school children and judge, they- Judge Osterley is retired. She is, she's a senior judge, they call them. Mm -hmm. So she, but she does runs this program where she brings school children in to put on a mock trial of mm -hmm. the big bad wolf is on trial for eating the three little pigs. So the children all have an assignment <laughs> to be either the prosecutor, the defense attorneys, <laughs> jurors, the judge, the bailiff, the yeah. every, all the roles and the clerks. 
and they, they prepare and they come in and put on their mock trial and then Judge Osterley talks to them and asks them questions. And it's a great experience to learn about the legal system. And I, I learned about that because my youngest son that just graduated, when he was, I think, third or fourth grade, had the opportunity to be involved in that. And I went, and I'm like, this what a terrific program. And at the time, my son was at Las Vegas State School, which is a private school. And I mean, that, which is wonderful. Those kids had that opportunity. But I, I would like that opportunity to be extended to as many children as possible within our community to come in, especially those that might be in, you know, lower income area and may not even have the vision of what's possible to give them that vision to come into court, see how the courtroom runs, look at these different options. And maybe that'll inspire, you know, a child to go into a legal profession. But to, or, but everyone needs to have an understanding of the legal system. So I, I love that program. That's just one example. Um, I also, you know, I've, I've gotten to know more about the Hope for Prisoners program, which I think is doing tremendous work in our community. Uh, there's Dress for, what's it called? Dress for Success. Dress for Success that helps the women. I, I went there one day just to drop off a quick donation, ended up being there for like an hour and a half and meeting the, the woman who's the director now and learning more about that program. And I'm like, what an excellent, excellent program to help women. I'd love to be involved with that. Um, we used to do a shadow on the judge program with the high school okay. that goes and um, stays with the judge all day. The students from the high school stay with great. the judge all day. I'd love to do that. I'd love to be involved in that. I also learned that the Clark County Bar uh, Foundation mm -hmm. has a program called Trial by Peers. I don't know if you've heard of that. And they, they didn't, like, they kind of shut down during the pandemic because of we we're all, you know, home. But they ha have a program where kids that have issues or get in trouble at the high schools uh, or maybe even the middle schools, but instead of having the case go through regular like juvenile court proceedings, they can be referred to this trial by peers. Mm -hmm. And there are students that are, again, the prosecutor, the defense attorney, the judge, but they're all mentored by attorneys and judges. And they have an actual trial in the courtroom and the, their peers are the jurors and decide what, what the outcome is. So I, I didn't know about that program. I learned about that recently. I think that would be something that would be great to be involved in, you know? So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's just so many, so many ways to serve in the community. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're not taking anything with us, but hopefully I could leave my mark on our community in a positive way and, uh, you know, and, and really be of service. And, and I genuinely mean that. I mean, I think, you know, I, I've volunteered as a cap attorney with uh, the children's attorney program through Legal Aid of Southern Nevada. And they provide, uh, representation of children who are in foster care. And that's a great program. I've been doing that since 2018. And our role is literally giving the child a voice in the courtroom. You know, when a child's put in into foster care, the, the parents have their own attorneys. The state represents the best interest of the child along with family services. But the child, this program gives them a voice. So I represent the child. If my kiddo client says to me, Amy, I want to go live with the man on the moon, then I go to court and I fight like heck for my child to go live with the man on the moon. That's my role. That's an extreme example, but that's direct representation. So uh, the legal aid attorneys, full-time attorneys, cover about 80% of the cases, but they recruit volunteer attorneys to cover, to fill a gap of the 20% or so to meet the goal of having 100% of children in foster care in Clark County have their own attorney. So what ages do you normally represent? You know, I have been appointed to represent babies, nonverbal children, up to kids who are graduating uh, out of, well, turning 18. And then there's programs that they can stay uh, under voluntary jurisdiction of the court so they can benefit from programs until they're 21. So I've represented a couple uh, kids all the way through to 21 as well. So I'm kind of everywhere in between. What age can a child decide, I want to live with mom or I want to live with dad? And that's honored. Is that 14? Well, or does it really depend on? There, okay. there, there is no law. Oh, there isn't for no. age? My experience as a cap attorney is, you know, their, their opinion, what they want is heard because it's heard through their cap attorney, you know, what they want. And, it, and my experience, the judges have taken that into consideration. Uh, I don't know that there's an age though where it's like, okay, if you're 14, then you absolutely, whatever you say is where you're gonna go. I think mm -hmm. it's all, everyone's opinion is taken into account. I do know that there's an age that they have to consent to being adopted. And I wanna say that's 14, but it might be 16. I'm not entirely sure, so. Oh, uh, you're talking about um, 
when they're 16, they could um, emancipate it, I think that's the term. Uh, well, emancipation is different, but in, when, when a child is placed in foster care, mm -hmm. there's a plan. It, there's what the plan can be reunification. Mm -hmm. It can be finding, you know, a permanent, you know, a alter situation. Too, no, no, <laughs> only, I'm, only as a volunteer, only with my kiddos. No, Steve, I'm not going there. <laughs> You want to serve on family I'm court? Just, I'm just about the kids. That's a whole five-hour show. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not going down that road. I don't know like, anything oh, about it. Go. What time? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, no. So if if the plan is that the child, like I have one client right now who who is not going to be re reunified. That's not even on the table. So it's looking for either like a, a more permanent foster care sort of situation or an adoptive situation, but. Uh, in order to be adopted at a certain age, the child has to consent to being adopted. You can't force them to be adopted once they're, I, I think it might be 14, 14 or 16. But generally my experience has been is that children want to be adopted. They want to have a family. They want to have their, their forever home. And every child deserves that. And yeah, it's... <sighs> what would you look for in a landlord-tenant situation? Landlord oh says tenants not paying the rent. Landlord can't pay the mortgage. Tenants still living there free of charge. Right. Yeah, well, what do you, what do you look if, for? If you've seen an onslaught <laughs> of eviction cases now that they're able to, you know, evict well, their tenant. I'll tell you, pre-COVID, at the time I was practicing with the firm that that's all we did. It was very straightforward, especially the uh, non-payment of rent uh, evictions. It, the law was very clear simple if you if you haven't paid your rent you get the it was a five-day notice back then and then you either pay rent or quit if you don't pay the rent then the landlord can go to court get the get the eviction order it was all pretty straightforward then covid hit and it was you know new directives and administrative orders coming out almost weekly sometimes it felt like we just get ready, you know, in, with one set of rules and then it would change again. And then there was like a little bit of time where I remember we, you know, the firm I'm with now, we don't do a lot of landlord tenant, but from time to time we would help clients. And we had a landlord tenant that was trying to get someone out and all these different directives delayed it, delayed it, delayed it. And we got a little window of opportunity and got it, got it done. But then it changed again, like literally the next week or two. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, we decided we're not going to do that anymore at our firm because that's just not our, our main area of practice because how it's changed so much. Now, my understanding is now there are, I know they've been using the hearing masters and they've had two courtrooms hearing these uh, backed up eviction cases. Before before uh, the pandemic, there was just the one courtroom. It's, uh, it's a hearing master, um, Brown, I think is his last name, that would handle the eviction cases. They've, like I said, had two courtrooms running them, I think two calendars a day at some, at some, at some point. And I don't know if they're still doing that now, but right now, if there's, if, if a tenant has applied for federal uh, assistance to pay their, to pay their back rent, then the eviction has stayed until they get that application either approved or denied mm -hmm. that, and it, um, that's my understanding. At least the last time I checked, that's what was happening. I've been a little busy the last couple of months. I'm not sure if it's changed uh, since since then, but I, I think that's still the case. Have you had an opportunity to visit the um, city or county jail? I have gone there as an attorney to visit clients at the at the county you jail. Did, you didn't do a tour. I've not done a tour of, of, of the jail here. I have done tours of, of other jails in other states where I've worked. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've toward both of them the county jail and the county city jail and the city jail. i never have not been in the henderson city jail. won't let me tour their jail okay I, I don't know why they just will not let me go in there huh <laughs> i've seen a client I've, I've seen a client in the henderson uh, jail out there but but um i've toured las vegas city and when north las vegas was with las vegas city jail that's the time i toured it now okay. las, north las vegas got their own jail back again i believe and the the cc ccdc i've toured there their facility as well, just to see how it works. Sure, and right. I'm, I'm not talking about as an inmate. I'm talking about as a, 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 you know, somebody concerned citizen of the public. All right. Just, I, just I understand. Wanted, you went yeah. on a tour. Of that. You were no. not in custody at the time, no, but you went no. on a tour. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Let's clear that up. Right. So, Miss Miss Wilson. Yes. 
the Las Vegas Justice of the Peace is, is a very demanding, demanding job. Yes. Um, and they have all these specialty courts. Right. Um, what specialty court do you think that you wanted to um, head up? I have such a heart for all. Well, there's, of course, the Veterans Court. Mm. And uh, right now, Judge Leticia is over the, the, the Veterans Court. I, mm -hmm. It would be an honor to be over that program. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had that opportunity. Also, the community court does a great service to our community. It, it, it uh, is for the homeless population to help them uh, not only address the crim criminal citations or the issues that they're before the court, but the issues that are, why are they there? And so e either of those courts. Why would you pick the Veterans Court? Why would I pick the Veterans Court? Mm -hmm. Because I love our country mm -hmm. and I am so grateful to, to be an American and the, the men and women that serve our country, that, that give us that gift you know, we need to take care of them. And there's, you know, I'm, I'm just learning about the different organizations and I don't know what all the answers are. But what I do know is that we, we owe our veterans uh, the, they've done so much for us. When they come back, when they're done with their service, we need to take care of them. I was at uh, the, Monday, Monday, Monday's Dark uh, fundraiser that Mark Schnick does a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And each, it's, I think it's every other Monday and it's a different charity. And when I went, it was um, Operation Homefront. Is that what it's called? They help, they build homes for veterans. Okay. And that was the, or that was a charity they were fundraising for. I thought that is, that is really great. I didn't know about that one before, but they, I'm like, yes, every veteran should come back and have a home. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to take care of them. And another organization I'm familiar with, uh, it, in our city is uh, Sober Homies. Have you heard of that Never organization? Heard of Sober Homies. Sober Homies, and yes. H-O-M-I-E-S. I-E-Z, I think it's <laughs> H-O-M-I-E-Z, I think. And they have several homes around the, the city and county where uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sober living ministry. Mm -hmm. And I, I went to one of their events recently and I met a young man who was a Marine for 10 years. N that was once always. Oh, I'm sorry. He, he, he is a Marine. Mm -hmm. He served for 10 years and he served in Afghanistan and, and in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And he, I, I had a lot of people to meet. We didn't have a lot of time together, but I, I need to learn more about him and his experience. And we did connect and I have to show you this. I brought this because I thought it might come up. I thought you would have picked the mental health court. Well, hold on. We're not, we're not <laughs> there. He, so my new friend, Jeremy gave me this. Aww. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And he said, no, I want you to have this. The, f the colors, the, the star is supposed to be on this side. Well, maybe it's because so when they wear it, it's on the right side. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Side. I think you would know, Steve, but he. Yeah. The, okay. The, so when they, yeah. when they wear when it, on their it side. Side. I think they put on their, so yeah, then that this maybe, right. Yeah. But he, he gave me this and I, I was insistent that he not, but he gave me this and he said, I want you to have this. Mm -hmm. You know, he said, this got me through the fighting in Iraq and, and in Afghanistan. And this is, you know, what I fought for. And mm -hmm. he's like, you know, we're, we're behind you. We want you to win this race. But it was just such a kind, generous, um, you know, gesture. And uh, we, we've, we've connected a little bit on social media, but I would, he wants to write a book about his experience in, in the Marine Corps. And I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. But I, I love these organizations that are there helping whether they're, they're veterans or they have, you know, whatever's bringing them to the sober living, you know, com community. Uh, let's be there for them as a community and, and, and help them get on a better path. It, it only benefits the whole community. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's from my friend, Jeremy. But I know there's been a lot of talk about a mental health court. I don't, there's not one right now in justice court. That's been something I you know I've heard a lot of the candidates say, you know, I'd like that to happen in justice court. And yes, absolutely. Uh, that's obviously a huge issue that we need to address as, as, a, as a community in, in every capacity. Uh, that's we're not we're, we're we're falling short. So yes, let's get a, let's get a, a a mental health court in the justice courts. Another idea that I um, you know John Ponder mentioned to me he he wants to have a hope court in the justice court, and I'm not entirely sure what that looks like or what his ideas are, but absolutely that's something I would sit and have a conversation about and see if it made sense and how we could potentially work together. Um, 
You know, people have to be held responsible when they commit crimes. Absolutely. Community safety, top priority. And once a person has paid their debt to society, they've served their term and they're willing and have demonstrated that, that, that they want to turn their lives around, then these programs and, and, and as a community, I think is the right thing to be there for them and help them to reintegrate into the community successfully. I was at a Hope for Prisoners graduation uh, a few weeks ago, and I, I believe John said that their, their rate of of success is about 80%. The 80% of the graduates of their Don't program are not going back. That's great. That's, That's huge. Yeah, that is huge. That is huge. Mm -hmm. So it, it just benefits the whole community to support programs, you know, reentry programs that are that are successful like that. I know First, Muni Court, they, sorry, I know Muni Court, they have the repeat offenders program. Do they have that in justice as well? I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Sorry. I, I, have, I haven't heard of that. The prison system just across the board, they did some kind of reform a few years ago, but I think there probably needs to be a whole lot more as far as like those types of programs where they rehabilitate these people, they work with them, they go through these programs in prison to where when they get out, they don't reoffend. And I think there's a lot to be said for those types of programs and we could do a lot more in the Agreed. prison right, system with those types for of sure. things. So that because they keep I mean, they come back. I think it's more than half the time they're going to reoffend. Um, I, I would think so. I, I yeah. can't quote you the, the statistics on that, but when I heard eighty percent of his That's his huge. graduates are not going back, that was That's like huge. wow. Yeah. And and there's another program I learned about. It's uh, Prisoner Family Alliance that helps the family while their loved ones incarcerated. It services the family, the children. So it strengthens the family. So when their loved one is released, mm -hmm. there's a stronger family, you know, structure to come home to, ideally. Yeah. Um, and and that, that can make all the difference too. So yeah. I, I, those programs are important. And, and I don't, and I don't, I want to make sure that, that it's clear that there are victims. When there's a crime, there's often a victim and their rights are absolutely need to be, uh, you know, protected, make sure that they have the programs that they need, and the counseling, whatever it is that they need. We need to make sure that we're watching out for the victims too. So there's, like I said, every file, it's not just a file, it, it involves people, you know, it's their life, it's, it's their families, it's the victims, it's their families, it's the whole community, so. What do you think your caseload is gonna look like? Well, I know right now that Department 7 has a general criminal calendar. And uh, last, about a year ago when Judge Tobiasen resigned, I was asked to sit on, in Department 10 uh, for once a week until the county commission appointed the new judge. And they said, oh, it'll probably be two or three months. It ended up being six months, which was a great experience. So every Tuesday I sat in department 10, which was also a general criminal calendar. So I know exactly what that calendar looks like from that experience. And it is very busy. I wanna say an average day, we'd have 80 to 90 cases on the calendar. What do you see the most of as far as crimes? <sighs> you know, really? It's all, all across, across the board, the board? all okay. across the board. I mean, Probably trespassing. I mean, a lot of, I mean, there's trespassing <laughs> <Home> citations <laughs> up to, well, and everything, you know, DUIs. Well, no, they're not well, DUIs because they're another court, but. Trespassing uh, could be prostitution as well. So. It could be, it could be. There's a lot of citations, but everything up, you know, to murder cases, you know, rape cases. Uh, yes, everything. And and there there's a pretty good mix of it, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, when they, we start the calendar, we, call the in custody cases uh, first so we can get 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 them you know get them through and back and then uh, you know private attorneys will come in and we'll grab and call their cases as they come in then we have the out of custodies and then we have the preliminary hearing calendar so you know often there'll be witnesses waiting out in the hall to testify in the preliminary hearing so it's important that a judge keeps things moving along of course you want to give both sides the time to see if they can't get it worked out but you also have to be mindful that there could be you know, police officers sitting out in the hall who've been on duty all night waiting to testify and, and civilians. I mean, we're a 24 hour town. So you might have a civilian witness coming off of a night shift sitting out in the hall waiting to testify or children. And so it's, it's important to, to run an efficient courtroom. And it's a challenge because of the numbers of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. Of cases. It's a lot. Wow. It is a lot. So who would you because, you know, all the judges, especially the new ones, they all have mentors, somebody that they 
go to and um, ask questions. You know, how would you look at this case? Give me your thoughts and your opinion. Who would you use as a mentor? Well, I can tell you exactly who I have used as a mentor because in that assignment for six months, mm -hmm. absolutely questions came up. I mean, there were times when I would say, I would say, you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna take a brief recess so I could go take a look at the law or go ask you know, someone, hey, what would you do here? And the judges I most often would go to, uh, Judge Zimmerman, Ann Zimmerman, mm -hmm. um, Judge, uh, Judge Sar Sargosa is the chief judge, mm -hmm. and uh, Judge, um, Judge Cellini, Judge uh, Sullivan is, I believe she's the presiding criminal judge. I know she was the three of us that were the regular pro tems in that department. She would, you know, meet with us and let it, we do like Zoom meetings and ask questions. And she was really helpful. Um, judge Sacento was right next door, his chambers. So I'd often just run over there quick. I mean, really, it was, they were all great. They were, they were all really helpful. I think Judge Bauckham had a, she had the DUI calendar at that time. So she kind of was doing her, her own thing, but I, I have a lot of respect for Judge Bauckham too. Um, Judge Leticia, I've, I've sat for her a few times, mm -hmm. and um, but when I was sitting, her chambers were down a few floors, <laughs> floors lower than where I, I was, so I didn't, I, I, uh, but she's someone I would, I would run things by if, if I had the opportunity to. Um, I have a lot of respect for, for all the Justice Court judges that I've worked with. How do you stand out with your um, opponents? How do you, how do you how do you set yourself different than them? Great question. Uh, there there are three candidates in, in my race, and my I think what makes me unique mm -hmm. and and quite frankly it, the most qualified candidate in our race is why you say that. Why do I say that? It's because. Uh, like I've explained, the Justice Court handles such a wide variety of cases. And in, in our race, I am the only candidate that has experience in both criminal law and civil law. The assignment right now in Department 7 is a criminal calendar. Now that can change. And that is, it's the chief judge of the Justice Court makes that decision, makes the assignments. So if Department 7 was assigned a civil calendar, I'm ready to go. We have a criminal calendar now, I'm ready to go. So I think that distinguishes me that I have the experience in civil and criminal. And in criminal law, uh, one of my opponents is a public defender, one is a, is a DA. I've done both. So I have the perspective of, of both of those important roles. So you're well-rounded. I'm well-rounded. And, and, and I have judicial experience, which neither of them have. Mm -hmm. I've sat as a judge pro tem in Arizona for three and a half years, another year and a half here. So I have that actual judicial experience and that different, differentiates me as well. And then I think my life experience, because that, that's important. I mean, I'm, I'm 51 years old, I'm, I'm a mother, I'm, I'm a grandmother now, and I've been you know, a team mom, I've been a volunteer in the community, I have been married, I have been divorced, I've gone through life and mm -hmm. had life experiences. Who hasn't been married and divorced? Well, I'm, I'm just say, saying, you know, you, and, and so there's an empathy there, an understanding there, and a right. compassion there for people. You know, I, I think I told uh, in our interview with you earlier and of our, our your endorsement interviews that I, when, I, when I grew up, we had a paper route in the morning, me and my brothers. We'd get up, you know, we'd have a day, each of us would take our turn to do the paper route. We mowed lawns, we I were expected to work. And, you know, so I, that's how I was raised <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the values of hard work yes. and, and, and expected to do well in school. And you delivered the you, newspaper? I did, oh, you did. Well, yes. <laughs> and she <laughs> mowed lawns. And I mowed lawns and we cleaned apartments. I did that too. <laughs> and we had chore lists that's before right, you go out and play, you did your chore list. I mean, that's how I was raised and with, with parents who- oh God, I'm really spoiling my 14 year old. She has none of that. Well, I know, I'm not, I'm like, my kids, well, they're, they're very helpful when I ask them to be, I shouldn't say that, but you know, it was a different, that, that's just how we were, we were raised. And, and I, I am who I am because of who my parents are in that they, they exemplified, uh, you know, hard work. Uh, they expected us to do well in school. We were expected to serve in the community and we saw them doing those things. I saw my parents treating everyone respectfully. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Northern Utah in a small college town that was, you know, pretty, vanilla uh, generally. <laughs> However, it's a university town. My parents both worked at the university. 
My father was in the athletic department and was an assistant athletic director for his whole career. So we traveled with the teams. We had athletes, the student athletes in our home for meals often. You know, we went to all the events and that was a really fortunate thing for us growing up in a, in a very, you know, a community that was mostly white is because we were able to see, you know, a wide variety of people and see our parents treating everyone the same and treating everyone respectfully. And that, that's important to me. And I'm, I'm really grateful that I was raised that way and with that example. Um, you know, when people come to court, it's, it's not a happy day for them for the, most, for the most part. No one wants to have to come to court. And I think it's important to make the experience, I guess, as pleasant as it can be, but in that you treat everyone respectfully. And inevitably, there's gonna be someone that's not going to like the decisions that, that I would make as a judge. But I would hope that whatever the decision is, that each person would at least leave the courtroom feeling like they've been heard. They might not agree with the decision, but feeling like they've been heard, they've been treated respectfully. Uh, that's important to me. And now I forgot what the question is because I'm just rambling off. But, um. <laughs> how, would you, how would you go with uh, hearsay if it was a police officer versus a regular civilian? Would you give the police officer more leeway than you would the regular civilian? Or would you... Would you have it fair and balanced? How would you do that? Now, Steve, you know, you're starting to ask me questions that I can't answer. <laughs> you know, we have the judicial canons that mm -hmm. restrict us from speaking about issues that may come before the court. <laughs> okay, so, Mike Volani. <laughs> um, I will say that. Mike Volani, that's all he said to me was that it, it might come oh. before the court. It might come before the court. Well, I mean, it, it, there are judicial canons yes, and we, and if we're going to be a judge and expect and hold people accountable for following the law, well, we, we sure better be following the law too. Um, I will say that, uh, you, you know, if there's a hearsay objection, I will listen to the objection. I will apply the law to the facts and, and make my ruling. That's exactly and, and, what I wanted you to say. And, you know, <laughs> in, in an impartial manner, you know, I, I have great respect for law enforcement. I have great respect for our average citizens. And I, and I, as a judge, you have to be impartial and listen and, and listen to, and, and observe and look at the credibility of the witness, whoever the witness is. Ms. Phillips, do you have anything else? No, she covered it. Yeah. Okay. Very thorough. Ms. Wilson, did, did, did you get everything out that that you wanted to get out? Wow. Um, thank you for having me. Absolutely. This 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 was really I really enjoyed being here. Appreciate the opportunity. I guess uh, what I just like to leave your viewers with is well, that wait, wait, before you say oh, that, okay. Mark is gonna zoom in on you and oh. then you tell folks why they should go to the polls and vote for you okay. and um, your point of contact. Okay. All right. So again, my name is Amy Wilson. I'm running for Las Vegas Justice Court Department 7. Uh, early voting ends on Friday, so you can go out and vote in, uh, through Friday. Uh, there's mail, you can mail in your ballot or you can go vote in person again on uh, Tuesday, the 14th. So the primary is in play in my race, so I'd really appreciate your support and uh, get, your, get your vote in, let your voice be heard. Uh, if you'd like more information about me and my campaign, I have a website. It's Amy Wilson for the spelled out F-O-R uh, judge.com, Amy Wilson for judge.com. There's email, uh, my email address, my phone number is on my website. I'd be happy to, uh, to, um, to uh, talk, speak with any, any voters and answer any questions that I can't answer and uh, look, look forward to, um, to serving the community as the justice of the peace in Department 7. Well, Ms. Wilson, thank you so much for coming on the program. Wish you, you the best of luck thank on you. Tuesday. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for coming on. Folks, that's Amy Wilson, candidate for Las Vegas Justice of the Peace Department 7. Amy Wilson is endorsed by Veterans in Politics, and anybody that lives in the Las Vegas area could vote for her. And we encourage everybody to vote for Amy Wilson that lives in the Las Vegas area. If you live in North Las Vegas, Henderson, Boulder City, call your friends in Las Vegas and tell them to go vote for Amy Wilson. She's an extraordinary individual and she'll serve her bench very well. This is Steve Sansa, Stephanie Phillips with Veterans in Politics. Until next time.